Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Matt Cotty, and I have the distinct privilege of being the first director of development for Revolutionary Spaces. I'm incredibly excited to have joined the team and be working with such a dedicated staff who've been working incredibly hard over the last few weeks to transform our programming and our fundraising efforts into the virtual world, adapting so that we can still carry out our mission of bringing people together while adhering to physical distancing guidelines. <clears throat> I'd like to specifically call out a few of those dedicated staff who are in the room today that have uh, really helped make this event possible. Uh, Lo Sotili, our campaign manager, Emma Strube, our executive assistant and special projects coordinator, Erica Lindemood, director of public and community programs, and Shakia Brittle, our director of events. <clears throat> Thank you all for your hard work and your dedication to Revolutionary Spaces. Before I turn the mic over to today's moderator, I wanted to quickly touch upon our upcoming programming. Over the next few months, the Revolutionary Spaces team will be launching conversations about how we can work together as a community to move through this crisis. As you'll hear today, the Boston community has overcome a lot throughout history. It is important to remember that learning from our past can, not, can, help, can only help us work together toward a better future as a, as a vibrant community that is informed, aware, and adaptable. After all, we are, we are all Boston strong. So now I'm gonna turn it over to today's moderator. Uh, we're excited to have the opportunity to partner with many outstanding organizations like the Black Caucus of Health Workers and are grateful to them for helping shape today's presentation. Shanae Birch will serve as today's moderator and is a Black Caucus of Health Workers board member and is currently pursuing her doctorate in public health education at Columbia University in New York City. I'll let her further introduce herself. So without further ado, Shanae, I'll pass the mic over to you. Thank you so much, Matt. As Matt said, my name is Shanae, Shanae Birch, and I'm grateful to be the moderator for this conversation today. I'm joining from sunny California, uh, and I am a formerly uh, Boston, formerly, uh, I'm, I, ooh, wow, I was formerly based in Boston as an actor. Um, and as Matt mentioned, I now live in New York where I'm studying how uh, arts and creativity impact health outcomes. Uh, so I just have a few housekeeping notes. Uh, so uh, just um, to give you a little bit of a timeline for the event, uh, panelists will be introducing themselves uh, in just a few moment, moments, and then I will lead them through a series of questions you've prepared for them. At the end of the moderated conversation, uh, we have a lot of time to introduce the questions that uh, you may have. Uh, feel free to use uh, the Q&A option um, when you're writing questions to pose to the panelists, uh, but feel free to use the chat option as well if you have any um, questions or concerns uh, about tech. Uh, so you can send those tech questions through uh, the chat feature, and that is at the bottom of your screen. If you do not see it, if you wave your mouse over the bottom uh, of your Zoom program, uh, it should appear. Uh, if we do run out of time before your question is answered, we'll be sure to follow up with you after the event. And now I'd like to pass it off to Matt to introduce themselves. Hi, thank you, Shanae, and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this, um, for this event, and I really look forward to speaking with the other panelists and also having a chance to hear from all of you who are taking part as audience members in all of this. Uh, my name is Nat Shidley. I'm a historian by training. Um, earlier in my career, I taught early American history and Native American history at Wellesley College. Um, I've worked as a museum curator, um, and now I have the distinct privilege to be the CEO of Revolutionary Spaces. And so I actually have a dual introduction. I really want to introduce the organization to you and, and just say a word about why we're engaged in, in this kind of conversation today. So Revolutionary Spaces is a brand new cultural organization on the Boston landscape that was formed just earlier this year through the merger of the Bostonian Society and the Old South Association, um, and through a range of uh, vehicles, community partnerships, 
um, a contemporary forms of storytelling, theater um, is one example, um, and important civic conversations like the one that we're engaged in today. We bring people together, not only to explore, but also to continue the work of democracy that is so singularly evoked by the two national treasures that our organization cares for. And that's the old state house in Boston, which is um, where the seat of government was during the time of the revolution here in Massachusetts, and Old South Meeting House, which was um, perhaps the most important local of popular politics and revolutionary Boston. Um, and we believe that the, the highest service we can provide is really to bring people together to continue the conversations that first took shape in those buildings 250 years ago. Um, we would love to be able to be present in one of our spaces and to have this conversation there because the halls really do echo with um, the voices that have been engaged in these fundamental conversations um, over so many years. We can't do that, so we're here virtually. I'm in Natick, Massachusetts. Um, there's a little bit of commotion in my kitchen right over here, so if you hear a little bit of noise in the background, that's what that is. Um, but we, we really believe that um, the current public health crisis that we're going through today um, gives us an opportunity to think deeply about these, the long arc of conversation that we've been engaged in as Americans. Um, so thank you for being here. I'd now like to uh, introduce and invite Alfreda to introduce herself and share her goals for the conversation. Oh, hi everyone. Um, my name is Alfreda Holloway Beth. I am the current president of the Black Caucus of Health Workers. In addition to that, I am the director of epidemiology at the Cook County Department of Public Health in Illinois. So I'm currently in Chicago. Um, some a little bit about my background. I'm an epidemiologist that focuses on morbidity and mortality related to chronic disease epidemiology, injury surveillance, occupational health and safety, and also outbreak investigation. And so um, that's a lot of things, um, but I try to focus on a health equity lens in, in those um, arenas. Uh, the Black Caucus of Health Workers is the oldest caucus um, in the American Public Health Association. We are 52 years old and we um, sit as advisors to um, policy development, advocacy, and um, general gathering of people of color at the um, American Public Health Association. And so we are happy and thrilled to be invited to um, talk with you guys. We are both a national and international organization and we have a very far reach. Uh, we do focus on um, research with other um, black and brown organizations to help tell stories and also bring information about communities from those communities that are within. So I think that this is a great space that we have. And for this conversation, um, we are really interested in understanding um, resilience through a public health um, aspect as we understand and recognize that uh, it's not just about individuals' abilities to help themselves, but about organized, systematic, and structural things that are in place to help us throughout. So thanks for having me. Awesome. And last but not least, Asa, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Asaf Bitan. I'm a primary care physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and the executive director of Ariadne Labs, which is a public health research and implementation organization located between Brigham Hospital and um, Harvard School of Public Health. Um, so as a practicing primary care clinician, and a person who also straddles the public health implementation and research worlds. Um, my interests uh, really have and uh, throughout my career been really on, on merging those two disciplines and really figuring out how we can take medicine from being an individ individualistic pursuit to um, really more of a population focus. And when one takes a population focus, one has to 
um, key in on disparities, inequities, vulnerabilities across communities and structures that make those vulnerabilities, disparities, and inequities happen. Um, and if one continues along that track, then you quickly realize that uh, um, at least a, um, a, a more than cursory examination of history and the way that um, history and structures are read on the body, body politic, but also as a primary care clinician can tell you that you can see history and its structures and current inequities read literally on people's bodies and what goes on in their health. And so that's led me to a deep interest, an amateur interest in, in, in local um, uh, American and, and New England history and led me to join um, the Revolutionary Spaces Board about six months ago, really to, um, uh, because I was really attracted um, and impassioned by the idea that we'd have a public cultural organization that wouldn't just look to the past as an ossified, thing in a cabinet closet or museum, but rather uh, a space to explore whose voices count, whose voices counted, and who could be counted both in the past, but also in the present, and more importantly, in the future. And so I'm just really thrilled to be here um, with these wonderful panelists and looking forward to the conversation. Wow, thank you so much. So I think that um, all of your introductions really uh, lead us to the first question, the reason why I imagine many of our attendees are here. Uh, we're living through um, the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. Um, we're living through our current public health crisis. And I'm curious uh, what, um, if you think, uh, our, if our past experience with epidemics help us to see the current public health crisis in a new light. Anyone want to take that first? So, well, um, okay, yeah, go ahead. I'll go first, I guess, as the epidemiologist. Um, I think that from the aspect of um, how important it is to keep people quarantined, um, I think that's a big issue. Um, in this day and age, people are very used to doing what they like, especially in America. Um, we do see some trends of decreased uh, effects of, of the virus in countries where we are able to really shut things all the way down. And I think that's something that in the US we will struggle with because no one really wants to think that we really do have to be a little bit stricter and tougher on, on um, keeping people in so that we can make this, um, the curves go all the way down. So I just wanted to say that I think a lot of people um, may uh, not agree with being quarantined for so long, but it is truly, absolutely important. Um, I'm not a historian of medicine um, or of epidemics, but I, I do think um, just reflecting on some of the past experiences that Boston has had with, um, with epidemic disease can be really helpful to us in framing um, some of the challenges that we're living through now. And I think the first point that, that really is most salient to me is just a recognition that we, we have been here before. I mean, I think we're, you know, our, our recent uh, medical history is such that we we feel like this is all new under the sun and we've had to rediscover the fact that there have been pandemics that have um, that have touched us in fundamental ways and and in some ways that that it's frightening but it's also reassuring in the sense that we've as a as a humanity has been through this we found pathways through it um, and this is not totally new under the sun um, but there are some other key insights. I mean, one one is, I mean, you, you look at at past experiences in Boston with epidemics, and that ranging from the, um, you know, the almost every generation experience with smallpox that Colonial Massachusetts had, um, the horrible cholera outbreak in Boston in 1849 that I think touched um, many communities all across the country. Um, not just, um, but not just the the, the flu, uh, the influenza epidemic of 1918, which we heard so much about, but all of these experiences across time. Um, you know, it it's very apparent. Um, you know, 
a we're in this together right uh we there's an impulse in the in the in a, a context like this to point fingers to scapegoat to draw boundaries but ultimately there's no hiding um, right in the 1721 smallpox epidemic, which was horrible in Boston, um, a thousand of the wealthiest residents of Boston pulled up states and decamped the countryside because uh, they had the privilege of having country estates and they thought they could get out. But in fact, um, there was no way to stop the spread of the disease amongst those who didn't have that privilege, and ultimately, um, it touched everyone. There's there's no getting away. Right. Um, I think another point. That, that really stands out is how important data are, how important knowledge is, right? There's there's a temptation to, to make it look a little bit better, right? Just maybe we don't have to tell all the horrible stories, it's depressing, but actually over and over again, knowing more helps us to find patterns and, and Asaf and Alfred, I'm sure you can tell us a lot more about what that looks like, but it's led to some of the great advances in, in our understanding of public health. Um, but to me, um, it's sitting in, in my role as, um, you know, having a, a responsibility for caring for this, these this pair of buildings where some of our, our core conversations about um, who gets to have a stake in our society took shape is the way in which um, epidemics, the, this epidemic raises a fundamental set of questions about the nature of our social compact, right? Um, how do I balance my, my own individual rights and liberties with my responsibility to the others in my community and how far does that sense of responsibility extend where do i draw the boundaries at the end of my neighborhood um, at the end of my city at the across the whole country who gets to be part of that right so i think it's the, this is a challenging moment but it's also it potentially fruitful moment if it can surface this fundamental question that we really need to have or conversation we need to have as Americans. I would, um, <clears throat> you know, to uh, agree with, with, with all that's been said and add that from my perspective clinically, um, you know, it, it's interesting, uh, Nat, that you, you raise how we, we have this sort of um, predictable amnesia about, you um, epidemics and pandemics, we forget that our, the people before us have faced them. And even with modern medicine and modern public health, um, we have been in versions of this before, but what's different now, of course, is, is the totally unprecedented nature of uh, how broad, how fast, how wide, how, um, uh, how devastating this, this, uh, this pandemic has been. Uh, in our communities, um, in, um, in certainly our health systems, our hospitals, uh, and in particular in our elder care systems. Uh, and um, how, the, how the, vi the virus, like most health crises, um, it, you know, a health shock approach approaches a system as it is, not as, it, as we would wish it to be. And what that means is that it lays bare, it exposes, it, lasers in exactly on the fault lines that divides the inequities, the vulnerabilities that those of us in the system know were there the whole time. Um, sadly, this is no surprise um, uh, that we are seeing uh, um, the, the sort of disproportionate impact on communities that can least afford to, um, to, to deal with yet another health shock. And it, it exposes the fragmentation of um, uh, a lack of, a, of an investment really over the decades in public health systems and data systems and social systems in, in, in um, really the, the forget safety nets, the sort of social determinants, the social influencers of health. And so when a crisis like this bears those fault lines and, and exposes them, we see the shocks and we see in a time of physical distance and social distance, we actually see, as you mentioned, our deep interconnection. And to Alfreda's point, we may wish that we weren't quarantined, but we know from really good evidence that our best bet right now on April 30th is to sustain with stamina, stamina fortitude and connection and responsibility for others in our community and in communities not in our communities 
to because we're all inter interconnected, we have to take care of each other. And so that's there's some deep lessons here that we have to grapple with. Wonderful. I I, I think these answers really um, again emphasize the the intersection of of our, our fields, and so um, in recognizing that the fields of public health and history both recognize the power of place, uh, what do we mean by the power of place, and why is spatiality important? Um, thanks for that question. I was thinking a little bit about. Um, how when we are in pandemics or epidemics that are um, spread through travel because like I, I, I kind of think of it that way more so than saying that like a, a virus can go across the ocean on its own because that's not a thing right so it's through our transportation and through our um, new industries that have been um, created that may be bringing us closer to zoonotic um, viruses uh, that we wouldn't have been close to without the opening of certain industries um, in various places. So place begins to be quite important um, in terms of when a virus can attack anyone. It, it's not like we think that because you live someplace you can't get it. It's like how you can use resources that you have to deal with that. Um, we, we're dealing with issues with people who um, are considered essential workers, for example, but they may not be in the healthcare field. They're the people at the fast food restaurants that are feeding the people <laughs> who need to go to work. They're the people who say, you know, I'm going to do um, a grocery shopping for people who can't come outside. So now they're putting themselves at risk. So when I think of place, I think of um, more so opportunities to protect yourself, um, establishing uh, resources for not only individuals but within communities to help protect people. Um, and place matters in terms of outcome and also in terms of access to health care because it's known that black and brown people may have you know great incomes and have insurance and have the access to things and resources but just based on skin color alone can be treated very differently in a healthcare setting or can't um, access things I believe on Tuesday we talked about how some black men don't want to wear masks because they're afraid of being hurt because they have a mask to protect themselves. So it's place matters, but place and um, demographics also matter. And I think that's a, a, a bigger um, entangling or confounding issues that um, go along with place. Would anyone else like to add to that question? Sure. I, I, I mean, you know, thinking about place from the perspective of a public historian, um, I think place codes for connection. And I think it's this is probably the same in the field of public health. It, it's, it's coding for social connection, right? Um, place matters because people connect within particular places and the nature of those connections cluster in particular vectors and that's how disease travels. Um, and I think, you know, the, when, when we talk as public historians about the power of place, what we often mean is the ability to stand in a place where people before were and suddenly feel manifest around you the connection across time, um, not just across the demographic barriers and social barriers that um, that we exist, we have uh, surrounding us at, at the moment. There's also a chronological barrier. So um, place can help us to see what's invisible, um, which is that we are all connected. Uh, but I think it's important that we learn how to read place well, because um, when we when we stand in any place, we, we see some parts of those connections and others are invisible to us. Um, and, and I think as Asaf and Alfreda have been 
indicating that, that you know the power of disease is such that it 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 does let you hide right what's what's invisible becomes visible to us in ways that are deeply profound right now um, those are just some thoughts about it yes and when i i just adding on to what you both have have shared when i think of the power of place i think of how people have to have a sense of place prior to that and how in places um, where places are identities and cultures are shaped um, but they're also sometimes displaced and tested and so uh, I'm excited then to maybe transition into our next question. Uh, so uh, data has shown as has already been indicated um, that the virus has disproportionately impacted communities of color, uh, which is interconnected with disparities. And um, public health professionals have come to understand uh, as the social determinants of health. Um, I'm curious if someone can define this for us, what are the social determinants of health, and then maybe others could offer ideas on what rebuilding trust and our capacity to heal these long-lasting social ills um, might look like. I always defer to my epidemiology friends first. <laughs> so when we think about social determinants of health, we're, we're thinking about things that are health related before care. So what is happening to individuals before they even get into a care system of sorts and things like that include what we call upstream factors like income, if you're living in a poverty ridden um, situation, your employment status, um, your lifestyle. So you're the behaviors um, that you uh, sort of do. Uh, and then there's also um, access to care issues. So that also is a part of social determinants. Um, and, and then when we look at healthcare um, delivery systems and those things. So when we take a lens of social determinants of health, we're saying what is it about individuals in their life that can either prolong life, have health, a nice quality of life, and um, make sure stressors are down and low. And, and then what are those things that make it different from people that may match on things like age or um, economic status, but there's a difference in sort of, um, in our country a lot is a, a, a racial dynamic, but in other countries it's a class dynamic. In other countries it's being foreign born or uh, native born really. And so it varies in the context of places and where people are from, if you're from Sweden versus if you're from the US, but we have our various ways of disparities um, that happen within a social um, context and determine a social deter um, the social um, determinants of health. But it is almost always looking at an upstream structural um, dynamic more so than just the individual, but that's the way we kind of measure and look at our, uh, our, our success measures, as we would say, like to figure that out. But it's really a, a, a systems sort of concept. Yeah, I, I, what I 100% agree, and from a vantage point of primary care, you know, we can, we know from very good research that, you know, uh, the majority uh, influence on a person's health is actually not going to be the medical care that they receive. It's actually going to be the factors that Alfreda had mentioned, in addition to some, you know, genetic factors. But the largest influence by far is, is a set of these social determinants. And so the question becomes, well, what does that mean and how is that translated into our current environment? And, you know, first we can start by just saying there's been some sloppy journalism. You know, sometimes people are saying, well, you know, I've seen, for instance, in media headlines, you know, um, being, in a, being of a particular race is a risk factor for worse COVID outcomes. Well, that's actually not true. Uh, there's no biological basis to having one group of people, human beings versus another group of people that we know of right now being more vulnerable biologically or medically to COVID. What is true 
is that the social influences, the social dynamics, the racial and, and other dynamics within our healthcare system that Alfredo mentioned, make it less likely that either people receive um, adequate care, have adequate access to housing, nutrition, income, all of the things that sustain and maintain health. And so language becomes really important because that's actually our window into solutions. So if we ask ourselves, well, why is it that certain parts of greater Boston have some of the highest rates of COVID in, in really the country, maybe the world, but then two miles over in, in uh, more affluent parts or uh, they're, they're really low rates, that's, that's really a social and public health question. That's really a question of place. It's a question of space and it's a question of race. And it's not a question of the biology of any of those things. It's about the social dynamics. And so, you know, one story just from my clinical practice, I, I um, serve a, a population in, a, in Jamaica Plain, um, Roxbury, Dorchester. You know, my patient, a lot of my patients have COVID right now. And, um, you know, you, if you call the state, you get in your lucky enough to get the test, you get the test, and then the nurse tells you from the state hotline, well, what you need to do now is monitor your temperature twice a day. A lot of my patients call me up and say, I don't have a thermometer. And I can't get a thermometer because the one pharmacy that serves 50,000 people in my neighborhood versus in another neighborhood where you have 10 pharmacies serving 50,000 people and 10 grocery stores versus one grocery store, you see all of those structures come into now we need a key service like monitoring your temperature. And you would think, well, what's the big deal? Just get a thermometer. And I can tell you, and Alfredo can tell you, and we can all tell you, that's not, there, that's a set of assumptions behind that simple sounding statement that impede the ability of a community and a family to have the best healthcare possible. And it's so, you know, the answer to that is to really start backing up even to as Nat may talk about the structures and past stories of why communities move and develop into the ways they are and have or don't have the same opportunities. And that leads you in to say, oh, okay, well, if there are communities that are getting hit hard because they're living in dense housing and they have economic and social inequities and structural racism, ah, then maybe it means we need to go the extra mile and the extra 10 miles to enable resources to be there to reach out and do contact tracing even more, to not assume that everybody has food and housing and thermometers and medicine and all the things that perhaps other communities take for granted. And then you start to get into a frame of adequately addressing what you thought of was originally just a clinical issue or just get a thermometer issue. Yeah, and Asaf, I think that's, it's a really, it's a really important point. Um, we, we can't, we can't address these ills narrowly. We have to think about the root causes and we have to mobilize um, the will to address the underlying causes, which is a much, it's a, it's a challenge of a different scale. Um, but, but one thing I think is worth mentioning is just the, the power, right? So to, we have to muster the collective will to tackle those challenges. And I think that there's an opportunity in the aftermath of this to use the memory of the current crisis as a vehicle for shaping a sense of common purpose. Um, you know, we, we uh, at, at Revolutionary Spaces just a month and a half ago on March 5th were involved in, in the 250th commemoration, you know, the 250th anniversary commemoration of the Boston Massacre. And the story there is really similar. It's not a public health context. It's a story about a different kind of crisis, but the story is about how people have used the memory of crisis to shape a a collective sense of purpose to address um, a problem and uh, and mobilize support for solving that problem. Um, and I think we, we have an opportunity to do the same, but it's really about making sure that everyone has access to the conversation and that if we remember this particular crisis and think about what it means to us moving forward, that we're having a broad conversation that all people feel included in and where their voices can be heard. Super. Uh super, super important points um, in ensuring that people's voices are heard. I'm, I'm curious, what does building resilience mean to you and for your work at this time? Um, 
or how are you staying mentally strong while working in conflict? Uh, I mean, I will take a quick shot. Love to hear others. I mean, um, I look at resilience, you know, from a public health and public systems point of view, and also from an individual point of view. They're related but not the same. So, from for me, from a public health systems point of view, uh, resilience is is um, the ability not just to withstand a shock, a crisis, a natural disaster, or a pandemic. But really, and not just the ability to bounce back or even bounce back better. That's one older definition of resilience I've seen. But I really think about it in my context of looking at the health system as the ability to, despite the shock, maintain essential services for all. Meaning that it's not right now just about COVID. COVID's obviously a big deal. We get into our PPE moon suits and we, you know, look ridiculous and, uh, you know, quite honestly hope that we don't get this, this, this horrible disease that we see in front of us. And you have to, in order to maintain the in, in, internal resilience or the individual resilience, you have to kind of make your peace with the fact that this is what you signed up for as a healthcare professional. And, I don't know that I believe it's heroic or any of that stuff, but I think it's, that's what we signed up for. And the most amazing thing that I see is thousands and then across our country, millions of people every day get up knowing, and, and I share this with them, having that fear. Because if you don't have fear of this thing, I'm not sure what planet you're on, but it's not, it's not that you don't have fear, it's that you act despite having fear. That's what to courage means to me and a lot of other people. And I don't know that it's courageous, but it's necessary and we need to be there and we need to have our communities back. But from a systems point of view, it's that ability to maintain the necessary functions despite an unprecedented shock and crisis and to do it for everyone and to do it not just for the thing that's causing the shock. Meaning that we have to be able to take care of heart attacks and strokes and have to deliver babies and have to do all the things that happen. And in fact, one of the things that worries us the most right now is that people aren't coming in for the things that they need to come in for. Our ERs are actually half full. I mean, I'm sure in Chicago, it's probably similar too. We're, it's, it's kind of creepy because we know that people are afraid of hospitals and they have the usual barriers in some communities to getting to accessing healthcare. And we know, and when we see people come in, they're coming in late, they're coming in sicker with strokes that have been already in play for six days or heart attacks. So if there's one message I can give, please do come in and please tell people to come in to the healthcare system, though COVID is around, not getting care for key needs is even worse. And so the ability to maintain that trust and connection and provision of those essential services is the, the deepest form of sort of systemic resilience I see. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And from a public health perspective, from sort of a community um, engagement perspective, I think that we also have to make sure that we use the, these, this opportunity not only to shed a light of what's going on and what it is not, you know, our system is not uh, at the levels that we thought it should be at, we use those opportunities to build up and build out. I know a lot of you guys, you may not know, like we, you just kind of hear public health is in the background, right? Like, you know, well, we got our vaccines. We, you know, everybody's doing pretty well. You know, we really trying to do better with chronic diseases, um, even viruses um, that were acute infections like HIV became more chronic, a chronic disease now with our medication and things like that. But the biggest issue is that there's not, everybody's happy with all of the gains of health that we have, but maintaining and being um, surveilling and making sure that that is always happening for things just like COVID-19, um, a disease that occurred from a, very, a novel virus, something new to us. And if we had, certain things in place, our ability to test people, our ability to quarantine people at, um, 
airports and things like that. If we had infrastructure in place, we could have really nipped this in the butt quite frankly, really easily, you know, but what the reality is, is that in public health, like in healthcare, all of these budgets are being taken and pulled back and have been done drastically over the last 20 years because everybody felt safe. Everybody's doing well, you know, you have things in place and, you know, we only see how fragmented we are when we have such um, situations as this. So I think, I, I think it's ironic for me being an epidemiologist is that I actually got into epidemiology because of anthropology and history. <laughs> um, I had a class that was a public health anthropology course and it was because of the history of understanding how people were resilient and broke through uh, and were able to make it through. Um, I just think about um, Bruce Jenner who's the, first, the father of vaccinations, right? He, figured out by working with milkmaids that they weren't getting um, cowpox because they worked with the cows all the time. They had this sort of immunity, the herd, what we consider herd immunity now, um, that was happening with them. And so we were able to figure out, oh, if you have some portion of that virus within you, um, then you can protect from getting um, severe morbid morbidity or stop um, mortality. So when, we have all of these things in our technology that's in place in all of our healthcare, we're doing fine. And then we lax on other things. I think this is what we get now. So now we're in this situation. So I think history shows us <laughs> um, one aspect and is able to capture that information and make sure that we are reminded, you know, you learn from what you uh, know about. If you forget what you know, and that's, I think our case, <laughs> we forgot what we knew. And so I think this is a really great moment to put all of these things together in this way. So I'm hopeful. <laughs> I'm, I don't think I'm anywhere near as sophisticated as Asaf and Alfreda in thinking about resiliency, but I do think it's really important for us to distinguish between what it means to be individually resilient and what we're talking about when we talk about social resiliency, right? That is the ability, as Asaf was saying, um, to, to sort of cope flexibly with the unanticipated crisis, but also I think to mobilize proactively to solve the anticipated challenge. Um, and there's so many challenges that we face. And I think in a very unsophisticated way, I think what this adds up to is we're, we're less resilient the more divided we are because to, to find those solutions means having access to an incredibly wide range of experiences and, um, and expertise and resources and we need everybody's ability to contribute in order to solve those problems. You know, just a, a small anecdotal example um, from a very divided time, but if you go back to the horrible smallpox epidemic that Boston experienced in 1721 with, I think it was 15% mortality um, among those who were infected. And, and it's a horrible, terrifying disease. And in the midst of all of that, um, you know, you had you had a physician experimenting with inoculation, um, which was a really critical insight in the history of, um, of healthcare. But um, where did the idea come from? Uh, it, it, it appears to have come from uh, Cotton Mather, uh, a minister, um, actually listening to the, the um, intellectual capital that an enslaved servant in his household brought with him from Africa, um, you know, where inoculation was common practice and it never been done in colonial America. And it took that knowledge in order for the idea to see the light of day. And it was tested in the context of the 1721 epidemic. But that's that like we need, we are stronger together, I guess, for lack of a better word. And we need to, we need to focus on the, the incredible resource that our diverse experiences are in solving the problems that we face moving forward. I think it's so important um, that you know, we um, acknowledge the nuance, I think, um, that was added to the word resilience and, and all of your responses. And then thinking about, um, like, when I think about building resilience, I also, um, it, it's almost as if it, it is in conversation with this desire or urge um, for normalcy, 
and to go back to normal and the way in which you've contextualized how going back to normal um, means that we don't have the infrastructure in place. We don't have the flexibility um, to which you're speaking about um, and the, the differences that can come together and, um, and make us more imaginative um, in rebuilding a better future. Uh, before we transition to um, questions from the group, I see one has already queued up. So I want to encourage people to continue to write their, their, their questions for us to answer. Um, I want to just say that, you know, we're going from headline to headline and I'm, I'm, I'm curious um, how you would respond to the instinct that many have to ask, you know, how can I help? How do we continue to care for our spaces and our communities while practicing physical distancing? Well, I think if I'll start very briefly. I mean, I think that um, one locus of help is certainly in healthcare and in public health. Um, but I would say for the purposes of this conversation, I worry a lot about what isn't happening in our vibrant cultural, artistic, and other community organizations. I worry about our local um, small businesses. Um, I worry about the things that make the interstitial character of our communities. Um, like Alfredo was saying, you know, it's like in public health. Public health, like our community organizations, are oxygen. You only notice them when they start to go low or go away, and then you freak out when they're already gone, and you're gone, because they make up you. And so what I would say is, healthcare, I don't want to say we got this, but we'll muddle our way through. We already spent a lot of money on healthcare in, the, in this country. But these cultural and, or, organi and artistic organizations, organizations like Revolutionary Spaces, organizations that promote art and theater and public conversations like this are critical and we cannot assume their existence. And so if you want to help COVID, I mean, you think of like what, what COVID is having both a medical and, and public effect, but it's also having an economic and cultural effect. And we need to be able to continue these conversations to be able to bounce back better. Matt, Alfreda, anything to add to that? I mean, that was, that was such a great question. I think I was reading the other day that, um, I think it's like 95% of artists have reported a, you know, a, loss of, a loss of income. And that's just one aspect of the arts and culture um, industry. One, yeah. one of many stats. It's a really important point that Asaf makes because there's the there's the healing that we need to do just at the level of our of you know making everybody healthy. But there's the there's going to be a lot of work at the back end, um, and the infrastructure to bring people together is going to be absolutely essential. Um, so um, I appreciate Asaf putting in a plug for the arts and culture work that we do. I think it is it is important, um, but. But yeah, we we are uh, we feel the absence of the community platforms that we um, that we sometimes take for granted during this time when we're all apart and socially distanced and interacting virtually. So um, we'll we'll need to really lean in on in putting the infrastructure back together at, at the back end. Yeah, I agree with both Asaf and um, Nat on on ways that we can help each other, the biggest way is to try to stay as safe as possible. Know that this is a serious situation. It's a serious matter. And I think that people um, don't want to believe it. We talked a little bit on other calls about messaging to various people. For example, you know, there was some messages going out to communities that, you know, black community can get it or children don't get it at all and you know I mean, like, so things that people I think that like with media and trying to know everything so rapidly we don't think about um, the consequences of the things that we talk about and, and how we uh, disseminate information well enough so I think that's the biggest thing is to um, make sure that people are following what the CDC is saying, what their local health departments are saying, their state health departments are saying, what is who's saying, the World Health Organization, not what TMZ is saying, not, you know, not what local um, news outlets are saying, because a lot of times 
of that information is kind of being um, sensationalized for the purpose of getting you riled up. But we really need real messages going out to people. Protect yourself, protect others, wear masks, um, make your own masks, but then follow the guidelines that the authorities are saying on how to make masks. Don't, you know what I mean? Like, I think that that's another thing in messaging and what people can do is, you know, it's nice to have a YouTube video of somebody being creative and things like that, but we don't know if all, all, of, all of these things are going to help. So going to those official websites, um, us as public health officials, making sure that we are presenting that information, that we're going to the news outlets, that we're telling people, okay, if you're going to have to make a mask yourself, this is how you do it. Wear gloves. What, you know what I mean? Like, but I think as a health, health departments and health, public health, that's what our charge is to do, is to make sure people understand this is absolutely serious. We are all getting this. And that some governors may want to open up the, their, their um, states and things like that, but that's not what um, public health is recommending at all, like not at all. And so uh, follow the guidelines of the of officials and not just look at social media and things like that. That is something that I think that we all can work on doing and making sure that people understand that this is um, the way it should be going. Um, so I think that's what we all can do. I just wanted to um, you see if I could briefly try to touch on the, uh, the three questions that I, I saw pop up on the Q&A. Um, the really good questions around um, examples of social change and innovation around offering different perspectives outside of public health into pandemics and, and what arts and humanities. Huge questions. What I would say is to Lisa's question, it's our failure over the last 20 years and actually more like the last 40 years um, to to really understand and learn and heed the lessons of, of SARS, H1N1, Ebola. Um, I, I can tell you, I was at conversations during and after Ebola at the World Health Organization in the World Bank, where everyone was saying, okay, no, no, this time we got it. We, we understand we're all interconnected. We understand everything's just an airplane away. We're gonna do all this post-pandemic surveillance and we're going to do all this health system strengthening and we're going to be ready for the next one they said it after h1n1 they said it after sars it's hard to plan for things if they don't plan nothing happens and that are kind of rare and exponential and and unprecedented events so it's our failure really to to plan for the worst to keep our stockpiles up to invest in public health to invest in the connection between medicine and public health and to keep this sort of individualized, atomized medical system, you're seeing the results of it. It's not uh, unfortunately too surprising to us, although I can understand how it's surprising to the public. You would think, you would think we, would, we would get this, but if you systematically defund these apparatus, you know, this is what happens. What I would say is that there are lessons, actually if you go 300 years ago, and Nat was mentioning, you know, the first inoculations, the first vaccinations, essentially in the U.S. were in Boston in the 17, during the 1721 smallpox. And then even more interesting things happened because in, in, a, in a strange way out of that horrible epidemic and what it necessitated and what it caused was a huge public um, battle about two narratives. One narrative that said inoculation works, look, data is good, facts might be worth paying attention to. I think you're, you know where I'm going with this. And the other narrative that just says, I get to make up whatever I want and that inoculation seems crazy. And that actually created the basis of the, my understanding, sorry to get out in front of my skis here, of the first public newspaper that wasn't just the King's News. And that newspaper actually took the anti-vaxxer status, which is kind of interesting. But, and it was also the paper that was run by the brother of a guy named Benjamin Franklin, who many might say, uh, you know, learned a lot about the value of the freedom of the press and the value of a discourse uh, and a free chain in, in a discourse of ideas out of, you know, watching two, two, two printing presses battle it out on whether we should vaccinate or not. That's an interesting thing that I think we should think about now because we can learn, 
if you, if you look at the big looming problem we have societally, inequities, disparities, and also this thing called global warming, which is a scientific fact-based kind of thing, perhaps what this pandemic can teach us is to have a different relationship with science, with evidence, with expertise, and with truth, and not just sort of leave it to a choose your own adventure who's got the bigger Twitter following or who's the bigger bully on TV, you know, in the White House, for instance. Yeah, I agree with you 100% on that. I think about um, things that we've known from a public health perspective have been bad for people for years. For example, um, say smoking. We knew as, as soon as um, tobacco was introduced to the people in the new world that it had the similar same effects that was happening to people who were sick chimneys sweeps in England. We knew that 500 years ago. It took 500 years for us to say that smoking caused cancer. Like, it's just like we know things. This is the same way with the smallpox, right? So you have an um, epidemic of smallpox in 1721 right, in Boston, but it wasn't until 1965 we eradicated smallpox, but we had that knowledge already. So almost over 200 years for people to um, really take heed to that, that we can help with this, you know? So it's when we think about like social change, don't be surprised if things don't change all that quickly. You know, we have a history of that not happening. We know we have evidence. We have, you know, what we call evidence-based um, uh, medicine and things like that. We've had that, the, the, the difference and what we need to work on is now we have evidence, but then how do people who know that information, who have an intimate knowledge of it, influence policymakers, influence uh, funders, influence um, social structure in a real way? So we do need to figure out that, like being, you know. The, the fact that someone can nominate whoever they want or appoint whoever they want to certain things without having qualifications, you know what I'm saying, or like even having um, accountability of anything or having to prove that they know stuff or have trained or know other people or can bring people together, that's an issue. Like, uh, you just randomly pick in some people, you, <laughs> you know, to tell us about what we should be doing, but that's not even their um, subject matter area, you know. That, that's the type of things we need to be pushing and forcing our um, government into to doing. Like, let's get qualified people. Let's get people who work on these things. And we all are still at the point of not knowing exactly, but these would be our best chances, the people in those arenas. And so I think that's something we should, and could and should be pushing for. And you know, Martha asks in this last question about what, what non-public health people can do. And you know, for me, data is not just numbers. I mean, data certainly is primarily numbers, but really data for health is stories. And you know, one story told well, one story framed in a photographic essay, in a beautiful piece of art, in a theatrical presentation can make more change can, can stick in someone's minds, can drive behavior change than reams and reams of beautiful papers and data. It's really the combination of the two. And so I think that, you know, we have to be able to tell the story of public health disparities and the impact of the lack of public health preparedness and the disinvestment in public health through um, a variety of means. And we will tell the story, we got the data part. People like Alfreda will give you the best data. And we need the other part from arts and sciences and humanities to tell the stories, to illuminate the data so that policymakers make better choices. That's, that's so great. I actually um, saw Martha's uh, question and um, wanted to in, encourage all artists and people of humanities to um, really um, consider the metaphor of it being a relay race. And we need our public health researchers and scientists um, to conduct the research using their, their ways of knowledge. But for us as cultural bearers, we have the opportunity to um, amplify these messages in the ways that we um, believe our communities will most um, best receive them. And so when we talk about, you know, artists staying in their lanes or, you know, not having um, 
anything to do with conversations about how we might facilitate public health or healing. And I, I saw um, there's, there's about three or four questions that we haven't been able to answer. I want to be respectful of people's time, but that's where we can, we can think we can look to the arts and humanities to address the concerns about mental health and well-being because something that even Matt has touched upon is connection, place being a, a, a place giving us the opportunity to connect and social connectedness. I, people may have noticed that the question was about physical distancing, not social distancing. Um, that's where this conversation of where how we can all work together really comes alive. So I want to thank the attendees. I also want to thank our panelists um, today for this um, just illuminatory conversation or illuminating conversation and um, assure people that this is just the beginning. We weren't able to cover everything, um, but um, we hope that um, our time together um, today inspires you to continue to have conversations about how the past informs our present and how we can look to the future um, to build more resilience.